Hello, I'm Tom Irvine, and this is part two of an introduction to shock and vibration. Last time we met, we were talking about a tuning fork, a small tuning fork that had a fundamental frequency of 440 hertz, which is an A note on the musical scale. Well, today we're going to talk about a couple of structures that are much more massive and have much lower natural frequencies, that is. So the first is the Golden Gate Bridge. This is a steel sus suspension bridge. The total length is 8,980 feet. And off to the right, you see the first four structural modes or natural frequencies of that bridge. And I wish I had a plot of the mode shapes. I don't have that, but I do have a description. So the, we'll say that the fundamental then is the transverse mode. And it has a natural frequency of 0 0.055 hertz. Now that number is so small that it's more convenient to represent the natural period, which is the inverse of the frequency. So the fundamental frequency has a period of 18.2 seconds. Then there's a vertical mode, 10.9 seconds, longitudinal at 3.81 seconds, and a torsional at 4.43 seconds. So those uh, frequencies are obviously much lower than those of the tuning fork. So the Golden Gate Bridge has to withstand a variety of environments. Of course, there is the traffic, which can include cars, buses, trucks, you know, semi-trucks and so on. But there's also the, we'll call them the natural environments. So earthquakes, primarily originating on the San Andreas and Hayward Fault systems. Winds up to 70 miles an hour, and then the strong ocean currents. So the Golden Gate Bridge has performed well in all earthquakes to date, including the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And that was the earthquake that interrupted the World Series between the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's baseball teams. Since its original construction, several phases of seismic retrofitting have been performed. And Caltrans is the California Department of Transportation and current Caltrans standards require bridges to withstand an equivalent static earthquake force, EQ, of 2.0 Gs. Now that last bullet there, that statement will become important to us once we get to our shock and shock response spectra units, which will be uh, later on in this course series. So that is what the, the civil engineers have to design build, design bridges to withstand is 2.0 Gs in California. And we're still in the Bay Area, and here's another landmark, the Transamerica Pyramid Building. It's built from a steel frame with a truss system at the base. The height is 850 feet or 260 meters. And it's, it's interesting about, about these buildings. So, so this, these buildings, in particular, this one in particular, can be excited by wind or earthquakes. Those are the primary sources of excitation. And an earthquake is a base excitation, and wind is an applied pressure, applied force. We'll be talking more about that later on. And th these buildings have uh, nonlinear damping. Well, you can also say the natural frequency is, is nonlinear as, as well. And, and there's different reasons that the, the damping would be nonlinear, and that has to do with joint slipping. So under very mild or kind of low to moderate loading, such as wind, it may be that there's no micro slip going on at the bolted joints, for example. But then during earthquake, which puts more energy into the building, then micro slip does start to occur at the joints, and that actually increases the damping. And there's also an effect on uh, natural frequency as well. So the north south component or direction has a 0 0.28 hertz uh, natural frequency. That was during the Loma Prieta earthquake. So another thing about these buildings is that they have accelerometers and they're monitored 24-7 because no one ever knows when an earthquake's going to happen. So during the Loma Prieta earthquake, both the north, south, and east, west were, were 0 0.28 hertz. And the north, south damping was 4.9% and the east, west damping was 2.2% again during the Loma Prieta earthquake. Well, what about just the ambient vibration from the wind and you know, you can probably include the, the, the traffic as well. So the natural frequencies tend to be a little bit higher, north-south, 0.34 hertz, and east-west, 0.32 hertz. So a little bit of a higher 
increase in natural frequency during the ambient vibration. And then the damping was lower. It was much lower in the north-south direction, ambient, compared to earthquakes. So 0.8% damping during the, uh, the ambient in the north-south. And in the east-west, 1.4% uh, damping. So some interesting uh, nonlinearities going on there with that building and some interesting effects. So, so it, it, it is known, even for something as simple as an electronic uh, avionics box, we do expect higher damping for higher excitation levels. All right, so the four sources, the purpose of this class is simplified, obviously. We are going to have four sources of excitation. And it's important to understand what the excitation source is because that will inform or drive uh, what type of analysis we do, what set of equations we do, and so on. So number one, these are not in any particular order, but number one will be base excitation, and then number two will be applied force or pressure, number three will be initial displacement or velocity, and number four is kind of kind of the quirky things otherwise that can happen. Self-excited vibration, dynamic instability, flutter, pogo. We can talk about negative damping. And, and those are harder to model, but we do observe those type of effects occurring as well. So we're going to go through and take a look at some examples of each of these four categories. So we'll start off with base or seismic excitation. I've also seen it referred to as support motion in a, in a particular textbook. Well, off to the left, we already mentioned the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and uh, how the Golden Gate Bridge withstood that earthquake and how that we took a look at the Transamerica building, how it responded in terms of frequency and damping to that earthquake. So most of the damage or most of the loss of life, I should say, happened on a, a, a on-ramp uh, to, to a bridge there and it was a, a two-layer, two decks there and, and the, and, and on this on-ramp on the Oakland side. And the, the top section, parts of the top section collapsed to the bottom section. And that had to do with some resonant effects going on between the excitation frequencies from the earthquake and the natural frequencies of that structure it, itself. In the middle, we have the Washington Monument. And a crack actually formed due to an earthquake in Virginia back in 2011, and that caused the Washington Monument to be shut down for a while due to repair efforts. And off to the right, we see a shaker table test. So shaker table tests are really big in the aerospace industry, also in automotive and other industries as well. And so we are applying a base uh, acceleration, you could call it a seismic excitation, support motion, whatever you want to call it there. We're going to talk quite a bit about shaker table tests throughout this course series. So we'll look at a few other things. It's really interesting to look at the natural environment. So base and seismic excitation. So if we're talking about ocean waves, your typical waves that you see rolling onto the beach when you're on your vacation, those are driven by the wind. But then we have a tsunami. So tsunami is, is driven by a earthquake event, a seismic event. So there is a displacement uh, in somewhere on the ocean floor. And in this case, we see look, maybe that would be two plates coming together at a boundary. And one plate is shifting downward. And the other opposite plate on the right is shifting upwards there. And that is causing a, a displacement, a base excitation to the water. And as a result of that, okay, that, that, uh, that fault line there is called a, a subducting plate uh, situation. So that energy then causes a tsunami. And the tsunami then can reach, let's see, out in the open ocean, it can be as fast as 835 kilometers per hour. And then it slows down as it approaches the shore, but its amplitude also uh, increases as well and can cause a tremendous amount of damage. Okay, a few other things. So off to the left, there is a lady and she's on this We'll call it a whole body vibration machine. Sometimes you'll see the acronym WBV, and it's a vibrating base. And the idea is that that helps the uh, persons develop you know, the muscles and circulation of the bodily fluids and 
bone mass density. It, it, you know, it has beneficial effects, maybe uh, stress relief and so on. I actually have a device like that that I use. There, there is some discussion out in the medical community about the real benefits of these, but uh, I, I think mine's helpful anyways. Okay, uh, I grew up for about 50 years in Arizona, and in Arizona, whether you're in the forest or the desert on a dirt road, it's very likely and highly probable that that dirt road is what's called a washboard road. So depending on the, the temperature, the humidity, the moisture content, the type of soil conditions, the traffic, and so on, it's very common to see this ripple pattern form in, in, in the dirt, the gravel there, and that becomes a base excitation for any vehicle traveling over that road, and that can cause discomfort to passengers, it can cause damage to the vehicle itself, wear out the suspension components and so on. And a few other very common things here. So on the left, we have a speed bump, and that intended to slow drivers down to between two to five miles per hour. So that's another source of base excitation. And then these longer ones are called speed humps, and they're designed to slow vehicles to between 10 to 15 miles per hour. So uh, those are a bit of a nuisance to drive over, but uh, they, they do uh, serve an important purpose. Okay, so that includes that concludes the, the base excitation. We're, we're actually going to be coming back quite often to base excitation in terms of our mechanical engineering and the response of components to base excitation. So that's uh, what you have to look forward to. Now the next category we're going to look at is called applied force or pressure. And this one has more examples readily available than the other three uh, excitation sources put together. So at the top left you see something called a, well it's, it's a small shaker and it's attached via stinger rod to, in this case, the fender of an automobile, and that's for a modal test. Now there's a transducer off to the top left, and that transducer is called an impedance head, and that measures the force input as well as the acceleration at the point of input. Now the stinger rod is designed to decouple the rotary inertia of the shaker from the fender, so we don't want the shaker properties to become part of the fender properties. That would throw off the measurements. There's also a possibility that there could be some additional response accelerometers at various locations. So the purpose of a modal test is to measure natural frequencies, corresponding damping ratios, and more sophisticated uh, tests will also be used to determine the mode shapes and maybe a few other parameters as well. So a small shaker with an applied force is one way of doing that. Uh, a simpler way is to take an impulse hammer, impact hammer, that has a built-in force transducer and just tap against the object. That is often done as well. Uh, the bottom left, we're going to talk quite a bit about this. This is a solid rocket motor cross-section. So the, the dark gray is the propellant, and I read that that propellant has the consistency of a pencil eraser. Now this particular motor had four ex exhaust nozzles there. And there are these organ pipe-like combustion cavities. So what happens is standing pressure waves get set up. So in the context of the hot gases, high temperature, high pressure, uh, and, then, and then the exit velocities are supersonic. So there's all these gas dynamic effects going on. There's also the, the potential of vortex shedding going on inside those cavities. So standing pressure waves get set up. And that uh, creates sinusoidal oscillations that uh, then propagate throughout the whole launch vehicle, potentially. Another interesting thing about those combustion cavities is that they grow in volume as the propellant is burned off. And that actually causes the, tends to cause the acoustic or pressure natural frequencies to decrease over time. The top right is a very, very important image there. Rotating and reciprocating machines. So we can have rotating imbalance, shaft misalignment, different effects with bearings and so on. Uh, we'll talk about blade passing frequencies later on. Uh, 
So that type of excitation we are going to model as an applied force, and we will do that later in this course. The bottom right, you may have ex uh, experienced this. So you drive along in your automobile, and there's some vibrations that kind of build up over time. Well, a primary suspect would be that there's something going on with your tires. There's there's a heavy spot, maybe, or or, or some kind of spot that. Uh, is, is causing a rotating imbalance effect there. So on, on the top left, you see there's a heavy spot kind of in the middle of the, of the tire, and that creates a, what's referred to as a static imbalance, where the, the vibration will be one times uh, that of the, the oscillation will be one times that of that um, axle speed. Then you could have uh, a spot on the right that's offset from the center line. You may be even multiple heavy spots or whatever. And that creates a, a vibration that would be at a frequency two times the, the axle speed. So you may, you may experience a vibration at one time, you know, the, the, the axle speed or, or, or two times or, or actually both uh, may occur as well. And, and that could indicate that you need to, to go and have your tires changed out there. So let's let's take a look at something else. This will be applied force or pressure, and we're still in that category. And wind or fluids. So one one kind of very famous and dramatic uh, type of uh, wind excitation is called a Kármán vortex street. So off to the left, you see this kind of bluish kind of arrow point upward. There is a oscillating force. It actually goes in both directions, and Below that arrow, you see like a circular cross section, and there is some fluid or gas that is moving from left to right. Now, if the Reynolds number and a few other things line up in a particular manner, that can cause the formation of a vortex street, uh, which, which in turn causes an oscillating force there, as shown by that arrow. So different parameters that we have to take a look at. What is the geometry of the cross section? What is, what is the fluid or gas speed? What about the kinematic coefficient of viscosity? There's Struhall numbers and Reynolds numbers and so on. And off to the right, you can see this chart that's showing, uh, we won't go through all these, but you can get the idea that there are you know, different Re Reynolds numbers. So if Reynolds number below five, you've got this very nice laminar flow and there's no vortex uh, effects occurring at all. And then as the Reynolds number gets higher, now, now Reynolds kind of, sh in some sense, is a measure of how disorganized the flow is. So at certain Reynolds number uh, regions, that then, uh, let's see, well, it looks like the, 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 the Vortex Street is still laminar, but we are getting these little kind of eddies uh, forming. And then we get to, 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 to turbulence here, and then we still have some of these little eddies going on here, but they're a little, a little rougher. And then at this uh, region of Reynolds numbers down, you know, second to last row there, we can see it's just sort of a chaotic situation in, in, the, in the wake there. And, and the eddies have more or less disappeared. But then we get to these extremely high Reynolds numbers, and those little eddies are showing up again. So yes, you can have laminar flow, you can have turbulent flow, something in between, and you know, just depending on what uh, regime you're in. The, these types of uh, uh, vortex streets uh, can get set up. So we actually, in the launch vehicle business, we're going to take a look at, okay, we've got a launch vehicle. It's uh, on the pad. It's a tall cantilever beam. Maybe it's being launched from Vandenberg, California, or Cape Canaveral, Florida. There's a few other launch sites out there, by the way. Those are the two main ones for the vehicles that go, the U.S. Lo locations anyways, for vehicles taking payloads into orbit. And we have to look at, okay, the launch vehicle is going to be on the pad maybe 10 days, two weeks, whatever, prior to launch. So what are the different wind situations that can occur? And is that going to cause vortex setting to occur? And uh, if so, how will that affect the, the bending modes of the vehicle and the loads imparted from the launch vehicle into the payload? And, and what is the stress that's going to be at the joints of the launch vehicle? And what about the stress where the, the vehicle meets up with a pad and the hold down clamps and so on. So I've, I've, I have colleagues that have put quite a bit of effort just into doing that sort of analysis. So we're still on applied force or pressure and now we're going to take a look 
at uh, some shock cells that can occur in exhaust plume. And these are really fun and dramatic to look at. So on the left, you see XCOR Aerospace, and unfortunately, they're no longer with us. But they had a what's called a static fire test or a hot fire test of their liquid oxygen methane rocket engine. And you can see, it goes out of Edwards Air Force Base, you can see this diamond shock cell formation there. Now this is going to produce a high frequency acoustic excitation. And acoustic excitation is applied pressure. Off to the right, you can see that this happens with aircraft as well. That's an F-16 with its afterburner turned on there. So what about these shock diamonds? Well, they form when the supersonic exhaust from a propelling nozzle is slightly overexpanded, meaning that the static pressure of the gases exiting the nozzle is less than the ambient air pressure. High frequency sound pressure is generated as a byproduct. There's also some uh, uh, low frequency excitation that occurs due to the turbulent mixing of the plume with the atmosphere. We'll talk more about that later on. So off to the left, in fact, I might be talking about that just in this next slide. So this is a diagram off to the left from, left from a document called NASA SP-8072. And here's a launch vehicle. It's, it's lifted off, and you can see that that uh, diamond shock cells pattern is forming in the plume core. And then this kind of peppery color here indicates that there is turbulent mixing going on between the plume and the surrounding atmosphere. And then that is generating sound, and you can see these d constant dB lines. So quite a bit of the sound is actually going to propagate most of it in the downward direction. But, but sound, there's something called a directivity pattern, and some of that sound is actually going to kind of turn backwards and head into the launch vehicle itself. So we're going to take a look at that, uh, particularly during liftoff and even uh, during ascent as well. Now during ascent, and particularly during what's called transonic, and then there's something called max-Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Depending on the launch vehicle, max-Q can happen before transonic or after. Depends on the trajectory and altitudes and Mach numbers and a whole bunch of other things. And what you see here is you'll see Q, that lowercase q, that's the dynamic pressure, which is one half rho, rho being the uh, air density, times V squared, which is going to be the relative velocity squared. So PRMS is going to be the resulting pressure of the turbulent boundary layer against the, the launch vehicle. So TBL is turbulent boundary layer. So the, the, the pressure imparted by that boundary layer will be a, a small fraction of, of the Q value. Now, it's not just turbulent boundary layers, but there's also different shock waves that, that uh, can form, aerodynamic shock waves. And then we can go on and talk about how there can be uh, separation of flow and uh, reattachment of flow and so on, depending on uh, change in geometries and, and uh, you know, the distance from the a forward end of the vehicle to any given station. So we're going to take a look at this in a, in, in a launch vehicle. It is, a, it is applied pressure. And uh, we have to determine how the, we call it the outer mold line or the primary structure, the skin or the skin of the vehicle is going to respond to that excitation. Then we're also going to try and determine how that energy propagates inward to where the avionics are located, where the payloads located. We'll have a slide in the next couple, two or three slides about that. So here's just a little bit more about what can happen with these exhaust plumes. So on a rocket vehicle, that plume is going to be supersonic. It has to be supersonic for rocket vehicles. And a little pattern of eddies is going to form on the periphery of the plume. And those are going to generate these Mach waves here. Let's see. So that we're going to talk about a convection velocity. So these eddies propagate at a supersonic velocity, which is very roughly 80% of the jet exhaust velocity. And again, that's called the convection velocity. The engineer researcher Fox Williams wrote that crackle correlates with convecting eddies and is predominant in the Mach wave direction. The resulting 
Pressure spikes are formed because of local convective steepening within the eddying motion. Crackling results in a distinct burst of strong narrow positive pressure transients in the time domain. So we've got a separate uh, presentation that we can go over about uh, nonlinear acoustics and acoustic time histories become skewed uh, if the sound pressure level reaches maybe 159 dB and so on. So there's a variety of things happening, you know, high frequency uh, from those um, shock cells. We have uh, low frequency effects from the turbulent mixing of the plume with the surrounding atmosphere. And we've got crackling, which is kind of an onomatopoeia word that uh, uh, describes another effect that, that's going on. So all, that, all of those combine to become an overall acoustic level. And again, some of that energy is going to propagate back into the vehicle. And this is just showing kind of some more of what we've been talking about. So these are just different uh, NASA images that I've copied and pasted. And you can see these little eddies, uh, small scale eddies forming to the left here, generating high frequency sound. And as those eddies propagate left to right at the convection velocity, they become increasingly larger. And then the sound uh, generation becomes lower frequency sound. So interesting effects in the bottom, you can see, well, the overall sound pressure level is, is a combination. It's an envelope of the turbulent mixing noise and, the, and, the, and the, the, the shock noise from those cells and throw in the crackling as well. And uh, it's, it's really not so important to try and, and say, okay, at this frequency, you know, this is the cause, and, you know, in terms of one or the other effects. Uh, we, we just look at the, at the big picture. Actually, I want to correct myself a little bit. When we get to NASA SP8072, we're going to talk about how we are going to do a source allocation and we're going to simplify this acoustic problem by saying that each frequency is a point source at some distance away from the nozzle. But we'll, we'll, we'll cover that later on. Uh, Liftoff acoustics. So we're, we need to take into account what is going on with the launch pad. So there's different types of uh, launch pads, uh, flame deflectors, there might be water suppression going on. And uh, you can see that plume there, and it is diverted by that deflector. And then the plume is kind of going along the ground there. And uh, there's again, we already mentioned directivity. So you can see these lines of constant uh, relative dB there. So mo most of the sound is actually gonna be projected kind of outward, maybe at about a 45 to 60 degree angle uh, away from this plume. But, but some, of it, some of that energy is going to kind of turn its head and start heading backwards. Not much, but enough to really excite the vehicle. So it's very important for a launch vehicle to, to design a, a, a flame trench and throw in some water suppression for good measure. Uh, there's devices called rainbirds that uh, uh, can do that. Maybe we'll talk more about that later on. Okay, so we're still, so, so again, as I mentioned, applied force, applied pressure, that is the, the biggest uh, source of examples of excitation. So we've, we've talked quite a bit about launch vehicles, rockets, and so on. Well, what about helicopters? So let's think of this helicopter uh, while it's on the ground, or maybe you can call that the tarmac. It's a spring mass system. So, so there's the spring mass systems. We, we, in our last unit, we talked about a spring mass system. Now, in this case, we're going to apply a force to the mass. Now, that force is due to the rotation of the, the main rotor hub. And if you want to throw in some other things like harmonics and blade passing frequencies, uh, we'll, we'll cover those in future units. Well, the, the point is, is, is the vehicle, the helicopter is getting ready to take off the frequency of that force is going to sweep through the natural frequency of that spring mass system. And that creates a situation called a ground resonance. It's a resonant excitation. And resonant excitation is to be avoided in the aerospace uh, industry. If you're doing musical instruments, for example, resonant excitation can be a wonderful thing. Not in the aviation and launch vehicle industries. Excessive uh, resonant uh, response can cause fatigue failures and other types of structural failures to occur. So to mitigate this, there needs to be 
well, a couple, two or three ways to mitigate this. One is there needs to be damping built in, a, a good amount of damping, because damping is going to control or limit the response at resonance. That, that's why we like damping. That's damping's main function, to limit the response at, at the resonant condition. Uh, there's also a certain sweep rate, so as that, as that rotor is, is spinning up to its uh, takeoff speed, we want, we want it to, to, to the angular rotational acceleration to be such that, that it passes through that natural frequency as, as, as quickly as possible. The worst case scenario would be to, to set the speed of the main rotor hub to dwell at the natural frequency of the system. And we're actually going to see a case, uh, you know, how dumb is that? We're, we're going to see a, a video of how dumb that is if we did a sign dwell uh, with respect with having the rotor hub frequency match the natural frequency, the structural natural frequency. Uh, another thing is that, you know, the pilot uh, needs to have skills. So if the pilot, whether takeoff or landing, uh, is, is noticing a, a ground resonance effect, then that pilot needs to get that helicopter off that tarmac as quickly as possible because once those wheels are just you know a couple millimeters off that ground surface, then the whole ground resonance goes away. So piloting skills also play a role. So we're talking about this. These are just some diagrams. You know, I I, I drew up kind of crude there, but get the point across. Well, you know, how how bad is this potential? Well, here's some examples. We'll see a couple of them. So this is a called a TH-55 helicopter. It's a military version of a Hughes 269A helicopter. And, and these are uh, same, we'll say the same part number, different serial numbers. So the top is what an intact helicopter of this model is supposed to look like. But the bottom, you see, as a result of ground resonance, it was just a complete uh, catastrophic failure of the, of the whole helicopter there. So this is a serious thing uh, that, that can happen due to resonant excitation. But wait, there's more. So we're going to take a look at a, a Chinook helicopter. Now this was a really interesting historical test that happened. This was not meant to be test to failure. That was not the purpose of this test. But this particular serial number was having some engine vibration problem. So someone got the idea that, okay, let's chain the helicopter down to that tarmac there, and we're going to rev up the engines. No, no one inside will do this all remotely, so we can study the vibration, get some measurements, and so on. Now, if all goes well, I'm going to click here, and I'm going to start this video, and you're going to see a ground resonance effect. So the whole body of the, of the helicopter is shaking and parts are going to start to fall off the, the helicopter. You see there's an open door bouncing up and down. It's going to be shedding a few parts. And then that rear section there, well, it looks like bust an oil line. And then you have a catastrophic loss of that whole tail section, if that's a, the, the correct terminology. This was sad to say a waste of taxpayer money test of failure was not intended but there's definitely some lessons learned there so so if you have a helicopter please don't chain it to the ground and and rev up the, the engine and and have some kind of dwell uh, with respect to the rotor speed uh, the main rotor hub frequency matching the natural frequency of the structure that's what to say. okay let's move on here so we were talking, well, we're actually back to launch vehicles. What do you know? But this can apply to aircraft as well. And this is, the purpose of this slide is to show that, okay, yeah, we've got these four categories, but, but one category of excitation can, as the energy propagates, be transformed into another category. Uh, people that do seismology know all about this with earthquake waves. So we've got a launch vehicle, and let's just say this is a liftoff environment. And there is this external acoustic pressure. So I've got some like wave front lines and some little arrows showing direction of propagation. And these could be from all different directions and so on. But I'm just kind of keeping this simple. And here we have like a cutout of a launch vehicle. So this is being called a fairing here. We can call that the primary structure, the skin, the outer mold line, its inner mold line, whatever you want to call it. 
But that is the, uh, if you call it, if, if this were an aircraft, we'd call that the fuselage. Okay. Well, there is a shelf here, uh, sometimes called a bulkhead or panel, whatever you want to call it. And up on that panel, there is an electronic component. We like to call that an avionics component. So this acoustic pressure is impacting against the outer mold line. And that energy is going to propagate inward, some of it is anyway, to the shelf. And it's going to become base excitation for that avionics box. So even though the, the original source is, say, the acoustic excitation liftoff, well, the proper test for that component is going to be to put it on a shaker and do a base excitation to replicate what the uh, input is from that shelf to the box. Now, the situation is a little more complicated than that because there's also some internal acoustics. And you know, we could talk about the transmission loss. So the box is actually being, being excited by some uh, internal acoustics as well as that base excitation. But uh, according to our understanding, our models and so on, it's the base excitation that is the driver. And that's why we go to the uh, shaker tables for testing our launch vehicle uh, electronics. And there's somewhere for aircraft as well. Interesting stuff there. Uh, okay, so we move on to our other category here, or actually our third one. And this is initial velocity, initial displacement. Now this is something famous, at least for a day or two, that happened. Uh, well, it's clear back in 2014, and this was the first iPhone. Now I don't. This was iPhone 6. I, I, I don't have an iPhone. It's probably. I don't know what the latest number is, but back in 2014, the very first iPhone uh, sold commercially was the number six model. And this was a big news event. It's in Perth, Australia. And so this customer there is opening up the box. And what happens, you know, this is on live TV, that that cell phone or smartphone, whatever you want to call it, iPhone, hits hits the ground. Okay, now, now the good thing is, uh, is that... It still functioned afterwards, but uh, it probably, that phone probably used up one of its nine lives uh, during that drop. So PED, that, that means a portable electronic device is at least on this slide. And they're expected to survive multiple drops. And uh, most original equipment suppliers specify between 30 and 50 drops. So that's some interesting background there. Um, now, this is an incredibly complicated, nonlinear problem to analyze, but we like to simplify things, at least as a first cut, first approximation. So we're going to say that that iPhone is a spring mass system on the left there, and it has initial velocity as it strikes the ground. Well, just think of your high school physics where potential energy, change of potential energy equals change of kinetic energy, and there's a, the, the kinetic energy is, is one-half mass velocity square, and the potential energy is mg, which is mass, g is acceleration of gravity, and then h or delta h is going to be the height above some reference plane. So, so anyways, I'll let you work out the mathematics, or maybe we'll, we'll go back and address that later. So we say that this spring mass system has an initial velocity as it strikes the ground, then it stays attached to the ground and just is oscillating its natural frequency. Now that is a, a vast oversimplification. It doesn't account for nonlinearities or what about bouncing and so on or okay did, did the phone did, did it uh, land on a flat face or on an edge or a corner and, and so on. This reality is a lot more complicated but to, just as a first approximation uh, we're going to model this as an initial velocity problem for this accidental drop. Uh, the, another common one is a guitar string. So off to the left, you see a, a, a guitar string. Maybe some of you are a guitarist. So, so the, the musician then is going to pluck the guitar string and give that initial displacement. Then suddenly release it, and if, the, if that uh, guitar string is tuned just right, it's going to make a pleasing uh, sound at its fundamental frequency and throw in some uh, harmonics uh, for, for good measure. So that's a very common example. Uh, in aerospace, somewhat rare to have initial displacement velocity, but occasionally. So on the right is a Pegasus launch vehicle, and it is uh, mounted underneath an L-1011 carrier aircraft. 
And that aircraft is going... Now, the launch vehicle is unmanned. Uh, it's got uh, three solid rocket motors, and it's intended to take a small payload into low Earth orbit. And there are four hook fittings that uh, come down from the L-1011 and mount to, in the wing box of that uh, Pegasus launch vehicle underneath there. So that carrier aircraft goes up to almost 40,000 feet and almost Mach 0 0.8, and then Pegasus is released. Well, you can't see it uh, with the unaided eye, but that Pegasus launch vehicle is actually bowing downward slightly due to gravity. So it has initial, you could call it initial strain energy, initial potential energy, but uh, th there, there is this uh, initial displacement of Pegasus relative to its equilibrium position simply due to gravity and the way it's uh, mounted to the L-1011. So Pegasus is going to drop for about a five second period once it carrier aircraft reaches the right altitude and the right uh, latitude and longitude and so on. And uh, then the first stage will ignite. And I think we've got a video here. We can actually see a Pegasus launch. Two, one, one. go for release. Pegasus is away. And drop, Pegasus is away. The ignition of the Pegasus rocket with Cygnus, helping hurricane forecasters understand and predict the intensity of hurricanes. Fin actuator system is working properly to control the flight of the vehicle during stage one. Power buses remain not. So that's the end of the video. And Pegasus is acting like a free, free beam undergoing a, a fundamental body bending mode during the five second uh, drop transient there. So we have some actual flight accelerometer data that we're going to uh, evaluate. So this accelerometer was mounted at the payload interface which is uh, inside the fairing nose and we're going to say it's in the vertical axis. And it's interesting it's acceleration in G versus time in seconds and it's very nearly in the form of a textbook damp sign function or you could say a decaying sign function there. It's not a pure damp sign function. There's a couple of odd cycles there, three or four of them at the very start. And what's happening is that when Pegasus is still uh, clamped to the L-1011, Pegasus is bowing downward in a static deflection shape. And static deflection, in this case, is governed by a second order differential equation. Now, as it's released and that initial poten potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, then Pegasus, after a few cycles, is going to settle in to its fundamental bending mode, which is governed by a fourth order partial differential equation. Now, a fundamental bending mode shape and a static deflection shape for Pegasus are very nearly the same thing, but not identical. So that's why there's a couple of odd cycles there at the first before it settles down into more of a textbook damp sign. Even so, it still departs a little bit from a textbook damp sign. There's some nonlinearities going on, maybe towards the end. Uh, damping can be nonlinear, for example. We've already talked about that uh, today. Possibly the contribution of some higher modes as well. But it's really interesting to look at this time history, which acceleration g versus time in seconds. We're actually going to pull that up and uh, take a look at it in MATLAB and do some signal identification. So we want to identify the natural frequency as well as the damping ratio. And it's pretty easy, if we were to count the number of peaks over a one second interval, it's going to come out to be about nine and a half. Or if you want to be a little more accurate, take the number of peaks over a two second interval, divide by two, and, and you'd, you'd see that's pretty close to 9.5 hertz uh, there after you do that division. So that's a pretty good way just to get a quick estimate. Uh, as far as the damping's concerned, the textbook method is to use a log decrement and we're not actually going to use log decrement because we've got a better way. And I'm going to show you what that is. Well, what the method is, is we're going to take a textbook damp sign function and do a hybrid least square curve fit and try and match that flight accelerometer data as best we can. And uh, if, if we can do that, that's an indirect way of estimating both the natural frequency and the damping ratio. So let's go to our MATLAB GUI package and
Up at the top there, there's an import tab. And off to left, there's the acceleration time history. This is a library function. And we've got drop transient launch vehicle. So let's read that data in. And then once we read that data in, we are going to go to signal analysis, to time history, to acceleration, and go to sign and damp sign curve fit. Now we were here before with the tuning fork data, but we're going to do something a bit different. You'll see what that is. So here again is that uh, damp sinusoid, and we're going to take a look at it, and we're not going to do a curve fit over the entire duration shown there. Rather, we're going to start at 0 0.4 seconds and go to 4 seconds there, because we want to cut off those couple odd cycles at the first where the transition is occurring from static deflection shape to the fundamental bending mode shape. So we, we, we call the data in and we actually plot it again to uh, pick the starting and stop times. Well, before we do that, let's go to the plot title. We'll call it drop transient and then acceleration G. Our start time will be 0 0.4 seconds, to end time 4 seconds. We already know that the natural frequency is about 9.5 hertz, but we'll just increase that up to 100 just to be kind of extra, extra cautious and conservative. Okay, now before with the tuning fork, we were on the sign tab. Now we're going to the damp sign tab instead. We're going to be looking for one damp sign, and the zero delay option will be set to on. That means that the, the textbook damp sign is going to start at 0 0.4 seconds there. Um, we'll keep the min and max damping ratios as is. It's actually going to be pretty close to zero damping. Uh, but let's we'll go ahead and just calculate that. Actually, as you can see, it's 1.1% damping, which would be a decimal of 0 0.01. So here's the uh, resulting synthesis. So the synthesis is the hybrid least square uh, curve fitting. There was uh, some trial and error and convergence built into that process. And uh, acceleration G versus time in seconds. The blue curve was the measured ex flight accelerometer data. And the red curve is the synthesis, and we can see there's a very good match there, uh, just with our eyeball check. And that's, that's a good sign. That gives us confidence that the numbers off to the right are a good set of numbers. Now, we're not so much interested today in the amplitude. Neither are we interested in the phase angle, but we're very interested in the natural frequency. Let's call that 9.6 hertz. And the damping, if we multiply by 100, is 1.1%. So that natural frequency and damping are important for several different reasons. So that number, that data, well, actually before Pegasus even flies, we need to make estimates of the frequency and damping and pass those along to the guidance, navigation, and control engineers because they, they're concerned about designing an autopilot with a stable control algorithm, and they need to know those frequencies. Frequency. Um, but actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that because during flight, that solid rocket motor stage is going to expel mass and that the body bending frequency will in increase during powered flight. So, so that's pre-launch estimate. We have to estimate every five seconds what the natural frequency will be of that bending mode. Now, for Pegasus, as it turns out, this drop transient is significant but after first stage ignites, that first bending mode is barely excited at all. So we barely see it in the accelerometer data, and it just doesn't matter. Uh, ground launch vehicles, a uh, different story. Uh, they can have significant uh, body bending during various uh, times during the ascent process. But this is an air-launched vehicle. There's also the possibility of higher modes uh, being excited as well. Although with Pegasus, it's just the fundamental mode there. So quite interesting. Of course, there's other concerns we have. The integrity of the, of the joints of the vehicle. So the joints are the weak links uh, for any given launch vehicle. That tends to be true. We're also concerned about the satellite, the payload. And there's a couple loads analysis performed to determine what the loads are uh, from the launch vehicle going into the payload. Now, we also have to remember that the payload and launch vehicle are acting like a combined system. So each payload is going to bring its own unique mass and stiffness properties into the equation.
and that's actually going to have an effect on what that natural frequency is. So a pre pretty interesting uh, situation there. We want, also want to make sure that the payload by itself has its own natural frequency uh, one octave higher. So if we, if we take that 9.574 hertz, let's round it up to 10. So we want the payload to be 20 hertz or higher to avoid a dynamic coupling situation. One other concern we have is what is the clearance between the payload and the inside fairing walls or inner mold line of the fairing? Because if there's some relative displacement going on, then there could be a loss of clearance and uh, impact, say, between the satellites or payload solar panels in the inside of the fairing, and that would be no good. So here's just a expanded view of a Pegasus. It does have the three solid rocket motor stages. On stage one, the nozzle is fixed, and the steering is provided by the three fins, anhedral fins on the aft skirt. So there's fin actuators. Then the delta wing, there are four hook fittings, those kind of grayish small rectangles are like the uh, bathtub fittings where the hooks come down to the wing box. Inner stage. Now stage two has a gimbal nozzle, thrust vector controlled, as does stage three. The two fairing halves, like clamshell shrouds, if you want to call it that. Most of the avionics are in the cylindrical ring, although there are avionics throughout various stations. Now there will also be a payload adapter and a payload, but those are not shown in this particular image here. Now here's a finite element bending mode of a particular Pegasus, um, highly exaggerated what the fundamental bending mode uh, would look like. Now the frequency at the bottom is 8.963 hertz, so for this particular mission, maybe there was a heavier, maybe a maximum weight uh, payload was part of this model, not quite sure, but that, that well could be. The next category we have is the self-excited vibration, flutter, pogo, negative damping, closed loop instability. It could go, the different uh, subtopics can go into this category. Tacoma Narrows Bridge, we should do a whole unit just on Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Uh, but the best explanation I've come across, it was a, a self-excited uh, flutter type of uh, oscillation that occurred where the movement of the bridge reinforced the force acting upon it from the wind. The middle we have pogo, and we'll be talking about pogo more when we get to our sine vibration section. But this is a case where the launch vehicle has a longitudinal vibration mode, or there's other possible modes that can interact with pogo. And there is a propellant mass flow rate. Now when I say propellant, there's a fuel and an oxidizer. So both of those together we'll call the propellants. So the propellant mass flow rates may experience an oscillation or a hiccuping type effect that coincides with the longitudinal natural frequency of the vehicle and the one reinforces the other and can cause an instability. We'll talk more about that later on. Wind tunnel tests and flutter. Now there's all different types of flutter modes, but one worrisome flutter mode is when twisting and bending occur at the same frequency. And you're gonna see a video here shortly. Let's take a look at this video here. Wind tunnel test, 1960 era, Boeing 747. So hopefully the Boeing engineers presumably altered the mass and stiffness of the, of the wing section so the bending and the twisting would not occur at the same frequency or took other mitigation steps. Let's look at it one more time. And you can see that the tail section is also participating in that flutter mode. Now on the right we have also from the 1960s era a twin Comanche aircraft in flight and there is a chase aircraft that took video. So let's take a look at the flutter of the tail section. Now over time we have repetitive cyclical loading and that could cause a fatigue failure. But that's not my greatest concern with that twin Comanche. My, my biggest concern is that that would cause some kind of instability 
for control, whether the pilot was manually trying to fly the vehicle and would overcorrect, uh, for example, or where the autopilot would have some kind of a interference going on with that vibrational frequency there. There's some instabilities that could occur. So loss of control, and would, which could result, say, in a possible stall, for example, is going to be my biggest concern there. So presumably the Twin Comanche company that produced that made some design mitigations, mass and stiffness changes and so on, uh, to, to correct that problem. So that's the end of uh, this section of the introduction. And uh, we'll have sign vibration in our next upcoming unit. So stay tuned for more fun. Thank you.